Yeah, so I feel like the Lord just wanted me to to share some encouragement first and foremost. I was asking the Lord before I got here today, like, what he was doing and asked him how I could partner with what he was doing tonight. And um, he told me that he wanted to refresh his people. I feel like a lot of us, and, and I know so many of us have been feeling it, and after talking to, to Skylar, who is four hours up north, um, the, the prophets up north have been saying the same thing that we've been getting down here, which is that um, there is a new sound that's been released um, from heaven, and it's the, it's the roar of the lion. And that with that, there has come a great shaking and a great sifting. And um, I didn't, the, the vision that the Lord gave me over the season that we were in was, um, I was actually on a mountaintop and I saw God the Father as a uh, gold miner. And he was on his hands and knees near a brook a mountain stream, and I knew that that represented the Holy Spirit, the stream, the river of, the, of life. And um, he was picking up these clods of dirt, and he was putting them into a sifting pan, and he was dipping them in the water and then shaking it, and all of the dirt began to fall, fall away, and these huge gold nuggets were being exposed to the dirt. And when I asked the Lord what he was saying in that vision, um, he said that many, and then there have been the earthquakes that have been happening, and I don't know if you guys heard about the earthquakes, and, you know, it's just like really bizarre things that, are, that we're seeing in our world, and it's speaking to something that's happening in the spirit, um, and the enemy is always doing the counterfeit for what the Lord is doing, so he'll try to send chaos and destruction. And while God is, is doing it to refine us and to purify us and to move us away from works of the flesh and religious routines and break us into what he's doing, it's, it's pure, intimate relationship with Father God. Um, so... If you've been, I feel like many people right now, or it could just be me, have been feeling like there's been like this intense shaking in their life. Am I witnessing to anybody? So an intense shaking. And it's kind of rattling when you're like, whoa. Like, what's happening, God? Like, I thought that I was on the right track, and we were saying that we were going this way, and then all of a sudden, like, feels like the bottom falls out. But what's happening is that we are being perfected. We are being refined. The the dirt, it represents the flesh. All the old fleshy stuff. God is removing from his people so that he can expose the pure treasure that is inside so that we are becoming and become the pure and spotless bride of Jesus Christ that he is going to return for. Amen. So when I heard him say, I want to refresh my people, um, you know, where I live, it's like bright and sunny over there. And, um, I didn't see a cloud in the sky. And then I pulled up in the parking lot and I'm, I needed to be encouraged in the Lord today. Let me just tell y'all, I got nothing. I got nothing but Jesus. I know nothing but Christ crucified. Like when I stand up here and I share my heart with you, like this morning I spent a good three hours of my day arguing with my husband. I am a person. I am a person that desperately, desperately needs the Lord in my life. And I I literally had to sit in the car and encourage myself in the Lord because I'm like, God, I 
all these people are coming for an encounter with, with you, not me. And I feel so unqualified right now. I feel so unqualified. And he said, you need to remember who you are. You're my daughter. And I call you daddy's girl. And I delight in you. You make me happy. You love me. You delight yourself in me. You be willing to serve the ones I've given you in love. And I'll manifest myself. And it's not because you deserve it. It's because I'm your daddy. And I will never leave you or forsake you. And so that's why I'm stepping out tonight like this without this arranged sermon. Because I'm trusting the Father to manifest himself however he wants to in your lives. So I'm in the car worshiping and then all of a sudden I hear something and I look over and it's raindrops on my window and it was just confirmation to me that the Lord is releasing a refreshing over us and then he gave me this um, this vision of a swordsmith and I don't know if you guys know anything about smithing a sword I'm not a welder, but um, I used to really like fantasy novels, so I hope that gives me some kind of credibility. (laughs) Um, When a swordsmith forms, forges a weapon, he takes the ore, the metal, and he puts it into a crude mold. He holds on to it and he places the metal in a fire that is so hot that it makes the hard metal palatable, like Play-Doh. Then he takes the metal out and he puts it on an anvil and he begins to hammer the shape into what he's making. And the Lord said that for many of us, we felt like we've been thrown into the fire of affliction. And that what the enemy has meant for harm, he is going to use to mold us and shape us into mighty weapons in his hand. I then saw that in the spirit as this weapon was being forged, that it's a new weapon. It's not like anything that we've seen before. I feel like for many of us, like I grew up watching the Brownsville revival um, on TV because my mom, she was spirit filled and she, she loved to follow what the Lord was doing in the earth. Um, And then even, you know, the Toronto outpouring and, and the great moves of God in the past. And I, I don't want to be so caught up in what he used to do that I don't realize what he was wanting to do now. And with each generation, there has to be a new weapon that's formed for our age, right? It's like the 2.0 series, if that makes sense. Like you have the first of something and then God takes it and he increases it and he makes it better. And so I feel like for a lot of us, this, this fire that we've been in, it's just been molding us and shaping us into the weapons that he's called us to be in our sphere of influence. And you know, Then in that process, the Lord or the swordsmith, he will dip that metal into water to cool it and to harden it so it takes shape. But it's not done there. He he actually will take it then and he will begin to polish it and he'll grind the edges to make it sharp, right? And who who are we supposed to look like? 
Jesus. The, the reality is that in the spirit, we already look like Jesus. It's our understanding coming into alignment with the truth that heaven has already proclaimed because we are co-crucified with Christ, meaning two hands, one nail. Our old nature was nailed to the cross with Jesus, dead. When the moment that we received Christ, we died to sin. We were, our old selves were buried. And then because of Christ, we are resurrected to new life in him. So technically, I'm not standing here as a 34-year-old. I am only six years old. Glory to God. Um, which is actually my favorite age group when it comes to kids. So it's, you know, some of you in here, you might have been saved for 20 years, but you're in your 50s or 60s. Well, hey, you're 20 years old in the spirit. <laughs> new life. New life doesn't look like the old life. That means that you're dead to sin. That means that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're, we are constantly being sanctified and our minds be becoming renewed to come into agreement with that reality, right? Jesus is the word of God and the word of God talks about swords being what? The, when we put on the armor of God, it is the sword of the spirit. We wield the sword through proclaiming the word of God. So if the Lord, if you feel like you're in a fire right now, then praise God, you're going to come out looking more like Jesus. You're going to come out looking more like the sword of the spirit. You are the weapon of mass destruction. Right? That's good news. And the Lord actually, he led me to um, Daniel 3, where he was, uh, it was Adrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I was floored when I was going through this story, and the Lord showed me. So Adrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were promoted. They were promoted by King Nebuchadnezzar. And when Nebuchadnezzar decided that they were going to worship a golden statue and he was going to send out a decree through all the land to worship this idol that was obviously dead to music, um, Adrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Jewish friends of Daniel and they refused to, to worship this idol. I'm... Um, they refused to worship the idol, and so Nebuchadnezzar, it was it was the accuser, it was the the astrologers and the necromancers and the wizards that came and like told on them, first and foremost, and had them thrown into the fiery furnace, right? It was so cool to me when I was reading that these three little Jewish boys that were living in Babylon that had just been promoted, they're like, oh, my whole world is about to fall apart. You know what I mean? I'm getting thrown in the fire. They said to the king, I will not, we will not bow down and worship your idol. Either the Lord God of Israel will rescue us from the furnace, and even if he does not, we will not worship your God. Their, their boldness and audacity to say, regardless of what you are going to do to me, I am not going to bow down and worship your God. So if our God comes and rescues us, then so be it. And if not, we win anyway. Because guys, we're, and this is true for us today. We, we war in the spirit, not to victory, but from victory. Our victory was won on Calvary. The moment, like, and it's like on Calvary where it seemed as if like all of hell was throwing a party because it looked as if they had won. It looked like they had won. Jesus is nailed to the cross. 
He died. He can't go around and perform any more miracles. His fame isn't spreading anymore in the land. No, nobody else is going to hear about this Jesus that they nailed to the cross. And God took the thing that looked like the ultimate loss and he turned it into history's greatest victory. Because it was when he was nailed to the cross and he rose from the grave. When he was nailed to the cross, he went down to prove that he was a man. Okay? When he rose again, it was to prove that he was God. And that same spirit lives inside each one of you. And that same victory is still true for each one of us as much as it is today as it was back then. And his kingdom is ever increasing. Ever increasing. It is not his nature to shrink back or to hide. And so his bride, it's not in your nature, in our nature, to shrink back and hide from the persecution, the afflictions, the, the challenges that we face. Instead, we need to rise up and we need to tell those things where their place is. And we need to ask the Father, what are you doing? What, what do you want me to learn in this season of the fire? But it's crazy. So Adrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're tied up by guards, by these strong men. And then they have the heat on the furnace, like, turned up so high that, yes, they turned it hotter and hotter and hotter. They turned it up so high that when the guards, when these strong men went to throw Adrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace, the strong men got burnt up. Guys, I got some good news for you. If you're going into the fire, then that means that the strong men that have been binding you, that have been keeping you from your destiny, that have been trying to hold you back, that have kept you captive and made you a slave, they're getting incinerated Amen. in the fire. Amen. The very place, the very place that the enemy thinks that he has you, God is going to use that place as a platform for your destiny to be launched off of. Okay. That's why it's called the refiner's fire. It's that literally it is a, it's an old Testament prophetic picture of us dying to self and allowing the old person to be tested and tried so that the fourth man in the fire can be revealed. Because it was when they were thrown into the fire that all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar, terrified, looked in and said, I thought we only put three men in the fire. Who is the fourth man? And he looks as if he's a god. It was the pre-incarnate Christ coming as a messenger that looked like an angel. And Nebuchadnezzar, the very evil, the evil king who threw them into the fire, begins to call out, Adrag, Meshach, and Abednego, are you alive? Who is that in there with you? And he calls them out of the furnace. That, like, literally that means that these guys had to walk up to the door of the furnace and they had to walk out, y'all because it was too hot for anybody to come let them out. It was too hot. So Nebuchadnezzar himself, if the, if the guards that bound him died putting them in the fire, they couldn't get anywhere near the heat. So they had to watch these three Jewish boys walk out unscathed and know that there was a fourth man in the fire with them. And what happened? Nebuchadnezzar, they didn't even smell like smoke. They came out, not a hair on their head was singed. Not one. And it terrified Nebuchadnezzar to the point where he bowed down to them. And he said, truly, your God is the living God. And he sent out another decree to command that all the idols be tore down and that everyone needed to worship the Lord God of Israel. 
Guys, when we go into the fire, it may seem like all hell is breaking loose on our life. It may feel very uncomfortable. I don't know about you guys. I'm a hairstylist. I use really expensive makeup and hair products. I don't like to sweat. I don't. It's awful. And life is not all waterproof mascara. And 24 hour lipstick. It's messy. It's messy. But it's kind of interesting that, like, even when we sweat, what are, what are we releasing? Oil and water. The anointing. The water of the Spirit. When we get in places where we feel like we're about to be burnt to a crisp, our house is going to burn down. That's when God does what he does best. And then when we come out, not not looking like or smelling like what we've been through, then God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Because it is all about him. It's all to him. It's all for him because of him. I was um, meditating on the names like Adrag, Meshach, and Abednego. I was even having like dreams and visions. Like the Lord was giving me dreams and visions about Adrag, Meshach, and Abednego. And um, I discovered that their Jewish names were all names that gave glory to God. Um, and that the, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar erected, so Adrath, Meshach, and Abednego. It was Hananiah, Azariah and Mishael, yes. Mishael means who is like Yahweh, who is like God. Azariah means God is my help. And Hananiah means God's favor and grace and ability. When they came to Babylon, Babylon worshipped the gods that were directly in opposition to God, Yahweh, to our father, God. They renamed these Jewish boys after their own gods. But it's interesting because when, when you see the Jewish names lined up with what the Babylonian names mean, and this is what shook my world, Hananiah, Adrach, actually means a slave to sin. And I was like, what? That's weird. Why does that mean, why does that name mean a slave to sin? It's, or a slave to Murdoch, which was their gods. It was actually like another, it was the Mesopotamian form of Baal worship, essentially. Um, I looked again and I discovered that sin was actually the name of the me- one of the Mesopotamian gods that the Babylonians worshipped. Sin was the name. So literally, the Semitic use of the word sin that we use today is because the Jewish people adopted the behaviors and the customs that were associated with that God's worship to what it looked like to be an abomination to the Lord Yahweh. So that song, We're No Longer a Slave to Sin, 
I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. It was because, and actually this was really cool. So during the Babylonian exile, that was actually when our, our biblical um, creation account was wrote. It was wrote like poetry. And this is, I'll tell you why. So in the Babylonian creation account, the Babylonians believed that there were two gods that got into a great war. And during the war, amidst all the chaos, creation happened. Does that sound like anything, any familiar theory that y'all have heard, like the Big Bang? Like creation just came out of chaos, like harmonious creation came out of a big explosion, a number of big explosions. That lie has been told for dawn of time. So literally two gods, big fight, warring over a region and a galaxy, and all of a sudden earth was created out of all this chaos and war, and man was created as an afterthought to be slaves and servants to the God who won the battle. Then you picture yourself or picture the Jewish people in exile. And they're remembering their God, Yahweh. And the creation account is that a attention to detail, loving God, who out of the abundance of love that he was experiencing in the Trinity, decided that he wanted to share that with a family. And so strategically, he calls light and darkness to separate. He commands the the water and the land to be formed. Then he calls the creatures into existence. And at the pinnacle of it all, he gets down, hands and knees in the dirt, and by his own hands, he forms a sculpture of a man in his own image. Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, on earth, in the mud, making a self-portrait out of earth. And I, I often wonder if in that moment that when the Father took a step back to look at his work, if the angels, when they caught a glimpse of Adam, didn't gasp in shock, <gasps> he's made himself. He's made another one. It looks just like him. And at the pinnacle of it all, he breathes life into Adam and creates a being that is just a little lower than God to fellowship with. That is, that's our daddy. That's our daddy God. Everything else he speaks and commands, but with us, he gets down in the dirt and he molds us. Right? So, When Adrak, Meshach, and Abednego were in Babylon, that was the story that they were holding on to about where they came from and about how God cherished them. And they were living in a culture where people were literally slaves to gods. They were bound in some of the, like, guys, this was before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was dark. It was dark. I mean, we look at some of the atrocities that happen in our earth today, and this is post upper room, y'all. That means that we are actually holding the dark back. 
the culture that these guys were living in, it was the Holy Spirit wasn't in anyone. It would come on people. He would come on people to perform a task, but didn't reside in us. That didn't happen until Pentecost. So if you guys think about how each one of you filled with the Holy Spirit and the light, you're actually, you're not thermometers, you're thermostats, meaning that your presence in a room is controlling the spiritual atmosphere and driving darkness out, unless unless you're walking in more darkness than you are light. But, but we carry that. This was before that. And this was a direct, literally, the statue that was erected. Commentaries say that it was either the idol god Sin, that was his name. You can look this up. It's wild to me. I was like, what? I didn't even know there was a god named Sin. Or it was a statue of King Nebuchadnezzar himself, who... Just a couple chapters later, the Lord humbles by making him a wild animal for a couple of years. And then he comes out of it and praises God and says, for God can humble even the proud. That was just a really cool nugget that I wanted to share with you guys. So literally, you are free to live a holy life and to live like Jesus did and to know that that's who you are, that that old life has been completely cut off and severed. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And the reason why you're in the fire right now is because you have been promoted in the spirit. If you are feeling the shaking on your life, then praise God in all circumstances because he is refining you. He is perfecting you. You are going to come out as pure gold. You are going to come out like a mighty weapon that is going to cut the knees of the enemy down all the days of your life. And it is the aspect of the loving father. The loving father. I am a firm believer that the war on fatherhood has been a direct attack of the enemy to destroy a generation's understanding of the Father God's love. Fathers provide, look, I love the book of John. The book of John, did you guys know that it was actually extremely controversial for Jesus to acknowledge God as a father? Extremely controversial, especially in Jewish culture. They thought he was crazy because he would talk in, in metaphors and riddles and um, in parables so that it was only the ones that were truly had hearts to hear and to seek the truth, even when they didn't understand that would be able to hear the message. They had to humble themselves and acknowledge that they knew nothing. They knew Jack and be willing to listen because they could feel it in the spirit, Right. They could, they knew because of the signs and the wonders that Jesus walked in. He said, if you don't believe what I say, then look at what I do. There's never been another prophet that does this. You guys have been asking me, but your eyes are closed. And so I will give you messages and parables so that you, your hard hearts that are understanding can't understand. He said that those who have ears to hear, hear, and those who have eyes to see, see. Right? So a lot of times, like, the things of the spirit look really foolish to the carnal mind. You know? Scripture says that too. But it's the Father's love. The Father's love. Fathers provide. So it was controversial because when Jesus said that he was the Son of Man and the Son of God, and that Jesus was as far that God was his father. In Jewish culture, he was actually saying unequal to God, which was extremely offensive to the Pharisees and to the religious leaders and any devout Jew at the time. 
because Yahweh was God Elohim most high. He was the most high, most powerful, exalted God, and he was to be feared. There were men like Moses who were able to go up on the mountain to meet with God, and he would he they'd come back down, their face shining, and everyone would be terrified because this man actually fellowshiped with God face to face. Right? It was absolutely offensive for Jesus to say God was his father. Extremely controversial. Yet, in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John mentions God as a father 250 times. 250 times. God tells tells the parable of what we know as the prodigal son but really it's the loving father. When I, okay. I feel like I'm supposed to tell you an intimate time that I had with the Lord recently. Okay. So my mother passed away a few months ago. A lot of you know that. Um, It was incredible watching a faithful believer go home, and I can't wait to be able to be baptized in that that baptism. That is, to me, to be a martyr is the, the ultimate honor as a Christian, to be able to stand before God and say that I loved my life, not even unto death, Lord as your good and faithful servant. Um, And all of us have to cross over into that someday, unless you're Enoch. But in that situation, my heart was really injured by my natural father. And I have purposely had to protect my heart from my natural dad. And so what has, what happened is I began to feel and accept an orphan spirit. Well, my parents are both gone now. You know, it's just me taking on the world by myself. And as I'm spending time with the Lord, he said, you've, forgotten your first love. And I said, what do you mean? You are my first love. You're, you're my only really, really real love. And he said, no, honey. He said, you forgot who you are. And I said, Lord, tell me who I am. He said, I'm, I'm Lord. But your first love is always your daddy. Every little girl's first love is their daddy. When I, years ago, when I had a radical encounter with God's love, I was pinned down on the floor for eight hours under electric convulsions, gold dust manifesting over me, hours of dreams and visions where God was pouring identity into me. He was telling me that I was his princess and that I wasn't in trouble anymore. Do you know that in Christ that you've been delivered from a spirit of always in trouble? You're not in trouble anymore. I went into, in this encounter, I went into a vision. I was a little girl, I was in a dark room, and or I thought the room was dark. Really, I was sitting in a, in a dark corner, and I was crying, and I was afraid to look over my shoulder because I thought my daddy was coming to yell at me. Because I was always in trouble growing up. Even if I really didn't do anything wrong, I was always in trouble because I was responsible for my little brothers who were always in trouble. And the view backed out, and there was Daddy God who, for some reason in my vision, he always looks a lot like my real dad. But my real dad kind of looks like Santa Claus with black hair. So... But he's a big, jolly guy, and he has white hair, white as wool, white beard. And he's so strong. 
and like masculine and comforting and soft at the same time. And he says, he's sitting on the edge of his throne with his arms outstretched. And he's saying, Christabu, come out of time out, honey. Honey, you're not, you're not in trouble anymore. Come sit on daddy's lap and let me love on you. Come here, baby. You're not in trouble anymore. And see, like I had had this belief system that I was just this wretched sinner saved by grace. And I was just lucky that I was getting into heaven, that like I had a relationship with the Lord, but I had been loved wrong, like by so many people my whole life that I could not ever allow the Lord to love me like a father. My dad was always overworked, stressed out and angry. And from day to day, I didn't know how he was going to feel about life in general, let alone about me. So it was easier for me to try to perform and to do things to gain my father's approval than it was for me to just be me and know that he loved me. And I realized that 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 viewpoint of, of my natural father was translated onto Father God in our relationship. That when I, I didn't understand that the moment that I received Christ, that I looked in the throne, like in the throne room of heaven, I looked as if the fall in Eden never happened to Daddy God because he sees me through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who paid for it. So in the spirit, it looks like I had never done anything wrong. So I wasn't in trouble anymore. That encounter completely shook my life and like completely changed the trajectory of my life. And I remember when I first got saved, there was a song, it's by Jamie Grace. I love the way you hold me. Do you know that song? I love the way you hold me by my side. You'll always be. You take each and every day, make it special in some way. I love the way you hold me by my side. You'll always be. I love you more than the words in my brain can express. I can't imagine even loving you less. Lord, I love the way you hold me. Oh, 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 oh. oh. I love the way you hold me. I didn't know any other Christian songs. All I knew is that for the first time in years, I was off drugs. My brother had just committed suicide. My husband was still using drugs. We were getting ready to be evicted from our apartment. I was going to be homeless again. I had no job, no money, no food stamps. No, nothing. I had a car that I had to bungee cord the front doors closed. And that's actually the car that I got baptized in the Holy Ghost in. I didn't get that. I literally, I didn't get saved in a church, y'all. I got saved in the this beat up Ford Contour that I had to bungee cord the doors shut. And it did not matter. Nothing, none of the chaos, none of the storm in my life mattered because all of a sudden I had this supernatural love pouring into me that I didn't know how to articulate. And it came out in the only Christian song that I knew, which was that song. And for years, so I'm, I'm standing in my living room or my kitchen and I'm, I'm singing to God. I'm, I'm feeling like, man, God, like I'm in the fire. Like, I thought you just told me like I was, you know, getting promoted. Like you told me I was getting promoted last week and I just had two cars break down. My bank account is zero. I got people talking about me all over the place. Like, and I'm, and these are people that I love that I'm serving and they're talking bad about me. Like, and I just don't really, I don't understand what's going on. I'm so sad. Like, Lord, help me. And I just like, I'm in the kitchen. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to focus on any of that. I'm just going to focus on you. And I just asked the Lord to tell me who I was again, to show me where he was at. And I started, I had been meditating on this one verse in Psalms, Psalm uh, 18, 19. And it's, your love broke open the way. You set me in a beautiful, broad place because your delight is in me. I've just been meditating on that for weeks now. 
And I went into a vision, and in the vision, I'm in this beautiful, like, scenic, like, path. And there's, like, mountains in the background, and, like, the road is lined with rose bushes. And all of a sudden, I hear this whistling, and I feel this presence on my side. And I'm like, what is that song? I know that song. I haven't heard, I haven't intentionally listened to that song in years. And then I hear a man's voice next to me singing, Krista, I love the way you hold me. By my side, you'll always be. You take each and every day. Make it special in some way. Krista, I love the way you hold me. And I'm like, and I look over, and it's my daddy God. And he has his arm around my shoulder, and he's walking me down this beautiful road, in this wide open place that's so beautiful. And he's whistling, and he's dancing with me, and he's like, honey, I love you more than the words in my brain can express. I can't imagine even loving you less. I love the way you hold me. See, in the spirit, we can get so distracted by the flies buzzing around our head, the accusations flying from the left and from the right, you know, the the made-up illusions and, and fears that the enemy tries to place in our minds, you know? And we lose sight of the fact that our daddy God, he's not worried about any of that stuff. He's worried about us. He's worried about the condition of our heart. And oftentimes, He's trying to get us to stop and to slow down and to pay attention that his presence is with us, that he won't leave us, that he literally, he can't imagine loving us less than what he does right now. Otherwise, why would he die? Why would he send Jesus to die for us? It just doesn't make sense. You know, like that kind of love is extreme. I mean, he, he, he loves us more than, than we can even, even fathom. And so then I started asking him questions and I'm like, well, Lord, what does it mean that you delight in me, in me versus over me or around me? What does it mean that you delight in me? And every, every version says in me. And he he began to speak to me. He said, Krista, he said, look, when you feel my presence, when you feel my tangible presence, whether it is waves of electricity moving up and down your body, whether it's the goosebumps, whether it's tears and the words that I speak to you pull on a place of your heart where you just begin to weep, right? He said, you are not just feeling my love. You are feeling my pleasure in you. And he said, that deep, deep place in you, that place where you're, you've been so convinced for years that if anybody else saw that place, that they wouldn't love you. That place. Do you guys know what place I'm talking about? That deep down, really, really real me place. Not the face that we put on. Not the masquerade. Not all the good works that we try to do to prove that we're good people and we're good Christians. But that deep down, really real us place. God. Father God said, that is the place in you that I arrive my deepest pleasure and delight in. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, well, Lord, I don't know if I understand all that. I thought that there was nothing good about me, that you only have this for me because of Jesus. Scripture says that it is in his presence there is fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore, right? So we are co-crucified, co-resurrected with Christ. We are in Christ. As in, like, we literally wear him like a glove, okay, in the spirit. This is what this looks like. When we received Christ, we were, most of us, I hope, received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That nature is now in us, and it has purified the core of who we are. That's why it's Christ in us. It's his nature in us where we have been completely redeemed and restored as if the fall never happened, where the father can drive so much pleasure and so much joy. And that when we laugh in worship or in the Holy Ghost, I get the tickles all the time. Or when we feel pleasure, that God is actually, what we're experiencing is his delight in us that begins to manifest in, in our physical self and bubbles out. It's so cool, man. I felt like tonight, like he, he wanted you guys to know, like he delights in you. Yeah, he delights over you with singing and with dancing, but he delights in you. Even the stuff that you are so afraid to expose to anybody else, Daddy God is a happy God over you. He's a happy daddy. He's not angry. He's not far away. The good news of the gospel is that he's near. He's no longer far away. And it says that all creation is standing on tiptoe, waiting for the unveiling of God's sons and daughters. Do you know what the unveiling is? Or what revelation means? In scripture, when we see those words, revelation, revelation light, and it's talking about light in the darkness, God is actually confronting ignorance. And he's saying that there's a flash of light that's coming to illuminate the eyes of your understanding so that you can see what's really there and what's really true to dispel the darkness. The unveiling is the revelation of God's sons and daughters receiving the understanding of who they are. All creation, the earthquakes, the fires, all this stuff that we're seeing, the blood moons, all of this is creation in labor pains. Labor pains because it is groaning for the revealing, the unveiling, the revelation of the sons and daughters of God to arise in their understanding of who they are as daddy's girls and daddy's boys. Because the moment that you receive that revelation, then you will walk the same way Jesus walked in the same way that Jesus talked, because you will know that you are actually carrying heaven and all of heaven's resources with you into every sphere of life, no matter where you are. Does that make sense? 